Right, here we are. Um, I'm Adam, and um, I have been doing these. Uh, we used to call this Talent Talk, this webinar, um, but we changed that. We're calling it now Talent Pipe. And the reason for that is because we um, have got a Facebook group called Talent Pipe, which is all about talent pipelines. And in this context, my talent pipeline is a succession of really smart people who have got interest about uh, recruiting. And um, so we did this session. Hung and I did this session last year, this time last year. And we only got halfway through what we wanted to talk about. So we did a second session a week later. Um, and we had some guests on as well. Um, so I just wanted to, first of all, um, uh, thank Hung for coming and joining me a, a year later. Um, Hung, do you want to just quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Hung Lee. Um, I'm the founder of a tech matching platform called Workshape.io, and I curate uh, a newsletter uh, for the industry called Recruiting Brain Food. And so um, anybody that's kind of eagle-eyed might have seen that Hung and, Hung and I um, have uh, started to do a uh, kind of one-hour se uh, session each Friday starting last week which is a preview of, sorry, it is a review of some of the things that um, we've been, uh, you know, are most popular within uh, Hung's Brain Food newsletter. Um, incidentally, I've said it online every week for about the last year, recruiting brain food, it will make you smarter and more intelligent. So sign up for it um, and it'll make you more popular as well. I keep saying that as well. Um, so sign up for that uh, because uh, even according to Google Hire, it's the number one newsletter in HR. Yeah, amazing. And thank you for your support, Adam. And it, it was sort of weird that we're back here because uh, we we're kind of going to do this is sandwich in between two of those live streams. But uh, but I think this is an important uh, an important show because, you know, you do it once a year and it's a review of what's what, or preview of what's going to happen. Um, and truth is, no one knows what's going to happen. Um, but it's useful to get different opinions and different people on and, and, and to have them give a view. So so, yeah, very happy and honored to be uh, to be invited back again to do this okay cool so um i think you're in the middle of um the sort of conversation around what does the future of work look like what does the future of recruitment look like technology um people how how the world of work is evolving and so what i want to find out from you first of all is from all of your kind of brain food over the last year, what are the things over the last year that people have been most interested in? I think there's a couple of topics. Um, em employee, the, the, one of the, the key things that I've noticed over the last year is, is, is an increased interest in employee experience. Um, uh, so if, if 2000s, and this is going back last year, but I assume this is, will, will be will pervasive in 2019. If 2017 was the year of candidate experience, 2018 is very much the year of employee experience, it seemed like. Um, lots of people are talking about it. Um, and this is just basically thinking about, you know, are our employees happy? Um, how can we make sure that they feel secure? How can we make make sure that they uh, want to do the work that we're giving them um how do we construct the work so that they do want to do it or i guess feeding into performance and retention um so if you want to take the, the the higher level in terms of where talent acquisition is we already know recruiting people from scratch is really really difficult um so one of the the strategic methods to to, to help you out in doing that is, is obviously retain the existing staff you have and i think the employee experience piece uh, was a was a big part of the conversation last year and will we'll certainly be so again in 2019. Okay, let's dwell on that for a second then because I completely agree. I think that it's been a topic that's been slightly under the radar but has, has been present under the radar for the last 20 years. I think you're right though. I think that we're sophisticated enough now, uh, both culturally and from a technology perspective, to create brilliant employee experiences. Um, this ties in with a subject that I heard Bill Berman talking about quite a lot last year, which is um, retention of relationship being something that organizations should be totally focused on. So that's retention of relationship with existing workforce, your contingent workforce, 
uh, and, your, and your talent pipelines. Uh, I love that um, phrase by Bill. Um, and I really think he's captured exactly what employers are, are looking to do. It's, it's not about retaining staff per se. Um, it's about re retaining a relationship with that human being um, who may interact with your business in some form in future uh, under different kind of uh, legal terms. Um, I think the idea even, you know, this may need lead to us needing to change the, the terminology of recruitment. You know, we call it talent acquisition as if we're acquiring it and it's our possession um, and, and these people are, are ours forever. Um, but in fact, no, um, these people are lending their labor and skills for a certain period of time. Um, and they're doing so increasingly under a diverse set of set of options. They could be permanent for us. They could be fixed term. They could be contracting. They could be working on a platform and we're dealing contractually with the platform. Um, they could be freelancers. They could be an agency that have turned into another way. All kinds of different permutations that this person is, is operating for us. But the people who are employing, um, uh, or should we say the people who are in charge of the talent, still need to cater for that population. Um, if you rewind back 10 years ago, uh, there was a kind of a very clear division between, oh, HR dealt with employees only, um, and anybody else who wasn't contractually an employee was dealt with by hiring managers or whoever it is. You know, it was, it was a procurement uh, concept. This person is contracting, hiring manager deals with it, HR maximum does payroll, something like that. Um, but now, I think the talent management function needs to cater for a much wider group of people, not just the employee demographic, but for every person who interfaces and supplies skills and labor to your company. Uh, and I think with Bill's term, when he's talking about retention relationship, what he's referring to there is that, um, is that people might oscillate between being an employee, being uh, a contractor, then coming back to being an employee, maybe then becoming an agent so that's going to deliver work for you. But the point is, if you have the relationship with the person, then it, it, it kind of renders it less important what the contractual, uh, the legal uh, definition of that uh, uh, sort of uh, connection is, as long as that person knows how to work and deliver the skills that you need. And these are increasing skills, I think, uh, that the people management function are going to have to develop. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. So you've got a scenario where um, there's a lot of transparency into organizations. If I want to know what it's like to work inside a business, I can go onto Google, I can go onto Glassdoor, I can go onto LinkedIn, I can go onto Facebook. There's so many different places I can find out what it's like to work in that organization. Um, I feel like employers should probably put their inside on the outside a bit more and I think they should there should be less distinction between the way they communicate with their employees today and their wider sort of um, talent pipeline. I think they should bleed themselves into the market effectively. That, I think that's absolutely right. If you think about the discretion of a company, uh, you know the the bound, boundaries of a company. Um, Twenty years ago, it was a very discreet boundary. Like you, if you once you're in, you're in, and you'd have all of this internal dialogue that would be kind of almost a secret cant that no one else would know about. Um, uh, but um, and, and then you'd have a, a, a public facing position um, dominated by you know what the marketing guys are going to say, or maybe top down or whatever it is, and it, you you'd not know what was going on. But the bound the the boundaries between companies and market is really becoming much more permeable now, um, and that leads us to to kind of to a direction where the, even what we think of a company being um, is, is starting to change. Um, you know, Kevin Wheeler was, was was one of these that has long talked about the future of an organization not being you know a twenty thousand uh, person organization. But really, maybe just a core group of people who might have founding equity in the company, but then surrounded by a network of people who would come oscillate in and out based on degrees of you know, on concentric circles, if you like, in terms of proximity uh, to that founding group. Um, and maybe that's the, the the future of a company: a much more flexible um, scale up, scale down uh, amount of labor that this uh, this the core group requires um so yeah very interesting times i think uh, we're definitely in that direction you know where we are on that journey we don't know but the, the arrows are pointing in that direction for sure so there's a lot of different demographic um kind of factors which mean that organizations need to take this issue more seriously 
And um, some of those that feature quite regularly on brain food are the, um, the sort of where people are in the world. So there's agglomeration happening and cities are growing, considerably growing. There is um, the impact of people being able to work from anywhere. Um, and there's a lot, you know, progressively more and more jobs are allowing uh, you to be based on the moon, if you like. Um, right. And then there's a few other factors which are impacting on this as well. So I, I, I really understand. I think there's two ways of looking at this. One is you've got that core group of what you described as like founding members of the business and then a large, much larger sort of community that they play in and play out as is, as is necessary. Or you could consider that your organization consists of those founding members, plus the people that are working for the organization today and the people that have worked for the organization in the past and might in the future, and the customers, and the suppliers, and any other stakeholders. And the organization consists of all of that. And they're all part of that one well, it's, it's. I mean, it's now gone into management theory now. People, people are talking about it as a, as a, as an ecosystem strategy. Um, so, so, so the idea isn't that you just, you know, a, a species in the ecosystem, um, but you need to be part of that ecosystem. Even you know, be the ecosystem itself, be the organization or the person that helps stitch all of these different um, nodes together. Um, and you're going to get sort of the, the value from that. Um, and that's definitely the way in which I think you've applied your business, the way in which I've applied my businesses. Um, it's, it's definitely, I see it as ecosystem support. So I think that mentality is really going to support certain types of people because it's all about connectivity um, and a, a, assisted by the technologies that you, you kind of um inferred there um it's gonna it, it would never be more connected um and physical proximity is not necessarily the most important thing anymore but digital proximity might be um and the ones that are uh digitally hyper connected um i think are going to have the competitive advantage really what you talk about cities is i think it's very interesting because just as an aside on that um, there is an agglomeration effect in terms of people wanting to move to cities, therefore producing more liquidity, producing more opportunity. You know, you can basically be have, I would say, uh, greater success simply because you, 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 you have more frequency of opportunity in a bigger city. Um, so we have that element. But I think the countervailing trend is this remote working idea, because ultimately it could be that the cities uh, right now are growing but maybe they've peaked um uh, without us even knowing it because you know why would you move to a big city crush yourself under so much cost of living uh, when in fact you could deploy your skills and services uh, uh agnostically in terms of location and still uh, accrue those benefits so i think the the, the two trends may not um, uh, there may be some tension uh, on there at some point, um, but it's it's fascinating to observe where where things are going right now. Um, and you know, I would encourage people to experiment with it. A friend of mine uh, only last week was weighing up whether he should stay within his company as an on-site person in this organization. Great job, great career. Um, and then he had the other option, which is completely location agnostic, global role. He was recruiting completely globally, but they did not have an opinion where he was to be based. And uh, one of the conversations I had with, uh, with uh, him uh, was to say, you know what, um, the future might look a little bit like the job that you might be looking at here. Um, so an additional factor you need to think about is maybe it would be useful just to do it, um, the new job, because you're actually going to educate yourself on what the near future might look like for a lot of people. Um, and, and, and that I think is something that uh, he embraced. So, so yeah, I think it's, it's a fascinating moment right now. Uh, you know, when someone writes the history of the labor, uh, sort of, of human work, this will be a very significant chapter in that, that, in that yeah, history. Massively agree. And, um, so the, the, there's the impact of cities and, um, the fact that, you know, a lot of people want to, a lot of people want to move into kind of where the action is effectively that creates additional opportunity for people. Therefore, arguably, people in cities are going to be able to progress faster than people that are not in the cities. And, and, and there's, there's a, absolutely a two-tier system here as well. Because if you look at the UK, there are um, three or four cities of kind of between 500,000 and a million people. And then there's London. 
and that's not the same track at all. That's an entirely different. Country. No, I mean, I mean, London is a mega city, right? So I mean, there's about thirty mega cities on the planet, which I just I think of a category of themselves in the sense they provide a disproportionate contribution to the economy. Um, they're typically super metropolitan, typically left leaning. Um, uh, and typically, um, because there's so, so so much diversity of the of the populations in these in these cities, um, uh, they often uh, break the norms, uh, and therefore they're more innovative because they're they're not constrained by a lot of those social norms that you know would force you to do this because that's what's always been done. So they're a fascinating place to be in, and uh, I know you're living in a big city, me the same, and I love being in, in a place like this um, because it's an inspiring uh, spot to be in. Um, but at the same time, you can see that, um, that this is not uh, this is not a utopian scenario um, because there is a huge amount of poverty in places like this simply because there is the disparity of wealth. Extremely expensive to be in a city like this, therefore, there's a barrier to entry for a lot of people, yeah. um, and and individuals have to subject themselves to quite a lot of very tough living if they're starting out in a place like this. So. Um, and that's not even talking about, you know, uh, on a political level. Um, uh, we can see already in, I would say, almost every Western democracy, uh, a, a kind of a movement against the metropolitan centers, um, uh, typically by uh, more regional uh, places that um, uh, have a problem with the overwhelming weight, economic weight and cultural weight of these big metropolitan centers that you see in sort of in the US and in, 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 uh, with Donald Trump, you see in the UK with Brexit, you see it yeah. everywhere in Europe with the rise of right wing. Yeah. Now that is hugely problematic for us uh, because what is happening is that th there is a break of the political economy. Um, uh, the, the economy is driven by these mega cities, uh, but the, polit the politics might be driven by the rural hinterlands. Um, and and that is a conflict I think um, has yet we've yet to see how that plays out, but it's it's yeah. not looking great right now. Yeah, yeah. USA is a perfect. Well, UK is a perfect example as well. I've got to say. Yeah. So the so, other yeah. aspect to this is the changing shape of companies. So specifically talking about the ability to work from different places, um, the UK is much more of a knowledge economy than it ever was, um, and I think a lot of Western uh countries are, are, are the same there's a lot of com there's a lot of a lot of the employers are people being employed for their knowledge what that means is that actually they can arguably be more decentralized and uh people can work from pretty much anywhere there's other countries where that's not the case in their manufacturing businesses or their organizations where there's people physically doing something and need to be working on site so i think the uk has changed a lot um in the last that's, 10 years that's true and and there's there's no doubt you know again we need to be careful of utopianism here because remote work is there's only certain types of work that is remote and and typically that is people who look at computer screens and type into keyboards currently um uh, lots of work is not that um and of course you physically need to be present to do a lot of those activities um uh, and uh but, but yeah um for a knowledge economy or a service economy like the uk overwhelmingly is um, then there is a big question mark as to why you would need to, to locate everyone in a single spot, particularly when you have a recruitment crisis, uh, particularly when you need to pay a huge amount of money um, to, to get people to do the commute, for instance, and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, with us kind of, uh, you know, 60 days or so away from exiting the EU, um, a lot of these service uh, organizations are going to lose access, potentially lose access, um, or at least have increased friction to access what was previously a labor pool of 400 million people. Mm. Um, and that constraint is, is, will be a huge shock. Yeah. Um, uh, and I would say one of the workarounds around that is actually an aggressive move to go to a remote first culture. Yes. Um, and, and that, I think, may be one of the positive outcomes of, of making a, a big system, a systemic change like, like we are. Mm, definitely. Um, OK. Uh, one word answer just before we move on. Um, is, is the UK going to leave the EU in 60 days? Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll ask myself that. No. Um, so uh, let's link that into Audra's question. Not the one about is Workday going to take over the world because I don't, I don't think that's a question for today. But 
like tangibly, we're talking about trends. We're talking about what we expect to happen in 2019. This is a really good question, which links into what we were talking about, the changing um, nature of the workforce, the enhanced requirements for keeping in contact with people. And Audra's got a question, which is, are recruitment marketing platforms going to disappear as ATSs try to make their own? No. Um, and Audra's got a great question there. Um, and, and the reason why, why not um, is because it's still a different product. Uh, and I think ATSs are going to struggle to, to bridge that, that, that point. And, and this is not on the ATSs that they can't do it. It's just the fact that when you've designed, the, designed a system purely to track applicants, ATS applicant tracking systems, in other words, you're only caring about people after the fact uh, of having already acquired them using that old language. And they are then needing to build uh, relationship management software, speaking to people who they have not a quote unquote acquired. That's a very different product, in my opinion. Um, and I think it may it may actually be better to stay as a different product um, because I know that again we have a universalizing instinct in, in software, in theory, and everything. And you know, one of the dreams of HR, why they ever dream this, I don't know, but uh, is to always have just one piece of software that does absolutely everything. I just want to look at one application. Um, uh, but increasingly, we're realizing that there's no company that can produce this application. Um, and in fact, as a business, you shouldn't really jump into bed with an organization that tells you they've got this tool um, because it's too much of a risk. Um, it's much better um, to try and look at different, the future of HR, in my opinion, is you're going to be a multi, multi-tool multi user and you just have to deal with that. Um, uh, you know, you're going to have to just think, I need to have decoupled systems that do certain things. Um, and I think with relationship management and marketing and stuff like that, um, I don't think that's pipe, you're not pipelining people at that point. Um, they're not ready to be subjected to going to a pipeline. Um, they want to be, they, they want conversations in a much more fluid um, uh, sense without this psychological step that they're going through a process. Um, so I think that the CRM, so, so talent relationship management software, might be a separate category. I think ATSs will do a pretty good job of it. You know, I, you know, in the sense that if, if you're not going to, if you're a smaller business and you can't kind of buy all of the software out there, you probably get away with doing some sort of relationship management stuff. You know, we do it already with email uh, and we do it already with our own stuff. We do relationship management in a crude way. Uh, so I think ATSs will definitely support this, but they're not going to eliminate the recruitment marketing software or, you know, what are called, I think they're called talent relationship management software is, is the, the term I've, I've, I've heard. Uh, but the, yeah, that category, I think, is going to exist um, for a little while yet. Okay. So uh, this is our second difference of opinion for today, because my answer to that is, uh, oh, the specific question is, are recruitment marketing platforms going to disappear as ATSs try to make their own? Uh, my answer to that, Audra, you might be surprised to hear is yes, they will. Um, and my reasoning for that is because ATS, I'm absolutely confident in that, but this is not a 2019 thing. This is probably a 2020, 21, 2021 thing. So I think they will disappear because companies definitely want to streamline their tech stack. If you look at an equivalent tech stack on the customer service and mainstream marketing side, they have a CRM, which effectively does what an applicant tracking system and a um, recruitment CRM does, to which we've got two separate um, categories here. We've got ATSs and CRMs. And then we've got recruitment marketing platforms, do we? On top of that, it depends on how the stack works. I'm absolutely confident that the smarter applicant tracking systems will consume the CRM space. Incidentally, Bill Berman's view is that the opposite is going to happen. And CRM will uh, become able to do what applicant tracking systems do. But quite frankly, ATSs and CRMs are both systems of record. They're designed for storing information. They're designed for enabling workflow. I don't know why they were ever a separate category. Recruitment marketing platforms, it kind of depends what you put in there. If you're talking about hosting career sites and you're talking about job board distribution and you're talking about 
sourcing, as in um, uh, as in scraping, effectively. <coughs> then again, I think that could be done in the same place. And you just look at somebody like a smart recruiters, they're doing all of that in the one place. You look at a lever, they're almost doing it. A greenhouse, they're almost doing it. But actually, greenhouse is interesting because it's gone the opposite way. Um, so I think that they are converging. And I, I don't think that, that, that CRM and ATS are going to be separate categories in the main within two years. Marketing automation, that's a different thing, though, because that's a different type of technology. So there will, there is going to be a lot. Of, there is going to be a lot of um, consolidation happening in the next couple of years. And actually, I was talking to a recruitment tech VC guy from New York a uh, couple of days ago. Last this time last week, he said there's going to be a lot of consolidation in the market, <coughs> and he knows that from the conversations he's having with the CEOs of big recruitment tech uh, businesses. Um, so. The next thing, I guess, is going to be around, of course, machine learning and automation. And I know it's a subject that's talked about to death, but let's talk about it in Jacob's in Jacob's words. Let's talk about it in the year in which we're in, right? So 2019, what is going to happen? Um, so, so I'm on record saying I've got a fairly permissive definition of what ai is um yeah. and, and, and i know you know a lot of people think ai has, has we've got a very high bar for what ai is you know they think it's a, a kind of a, a sentient piece of software that has parity with a human being um which of course is ai but for me you can have a much lower bar and still call this something artificially intelligent um uh, in the sense that if is is the thing able to learn from the data it gets um, and it and changes behavior as a result. Um, uh, you know, that could be a much lower level, uh, it doesn't have to achieve sentience for it to be artificially intelligent. So where are we with AI? AI already exists in, in recruitment technology. Um, it already exists in HR, um, and it will, it will become more ubiquitous. Um, I think in 2019, again, just narrow it down to from, from um, with Jacob's comment, where I would see AI probably apply is something quite trivial, you know? Um, everyone everyone knows that uh, the logistics of recruiting is one of the big, actually, uh, sort of uh, draws of time and labor, you know, chasing people for email, chasing people for feedback, doing all of that type of fetching and carrying of information, really. That is absolutely doable by a bot, absolutely doable by something that could learn. Um, so I think s s scheduling, um yeah. is something that will 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 be quite quickly adopted we probably won't care about it it won't even be noticeable but suddenly we're going to stop spending a lot of time trying to figure out who's available when and where uh, and that thing just gets done so i would like i would i would say that there will be this kind of again single shot impact on on your workflow you probably won't feel it and then you've got uh, that then it's there and we'll, we'll we'll dismiss it as important because hey wasn't it always like this um, and then we'll move on to the next little thing. So yeah, I, I just think you know we need to have a less of a, 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 a. It's not even a straw man. It's just like we create this sort of uh, a thing to say, look, AI is has to be like uh, uh, the, the computer out of Odyssey two thousand and one. You know, some kind of sentient thing having a conversation with you. That's miles away. Um, uh, but you're going to get practical tools that are definitely artificially intelligent that are going to help recruiters out. So yeah, let's see that happen. Okay, so what proportion of a look? You and I started in recruitment in like the late '90s. So, what um, proportion of our job from then is is able to be um, automated today? I'd say about forty, fifty percent. Um, if you look at the work that we we're doing, um, uh, there was a large amount of human human stuff actually at that 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 period so that is still there the conversations the face to face the the interviews and all that type of stuff we're still doing that but you look at all of the 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 the, the tech work the, the research right? information retrieval you know why is a human being doing that yeah. um clearly um uh, uh, if you think what what sourcing is so I'm, I'm not a critic of sourcing i think sourcing is hugely important um but it's obviously a uh, skill that has a uh, shelf life 
Um, uh, because if you think about what sourcing is, it's, it's basically human beings interrogating inefficient systems to extract information. Mm. Um, and the reason why we need to develop deep skills in sourcing is because the damn system is inefficient. It doesn't give us the information we want. Therefore, we need to think about how this machine actually processes information. Oh, we need to break it down like this, and we need to write some sort of Boolean strings in order to extract the data. Now, there's absolutely no reason why a human beings should be doing that today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, because there's, the, firstly, the systems are going to get more efficient. And secondly, you can program something to do that sourcing for you um, and do it 24 by 7, never stop, never fail, never make a mistake, just literally present you with the opportunities. I think um, IBM, um, uh, 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 and again, you know, I'm, I'm aware that they ultimately want to push this product onto market and sell it, um, but their internal team is telling me that they ha have this automated source already. Yeah. Um, uh, where they're using technology literally to go through what a human being would do and spend hours sc scraping this information or interrogating the system. And in fact, this uh, piece of software is doing it for them and identifying a very short list of people to say, you know what, you human beings should do the outreach to these 10 people because based on what you're looking for, we think these are the right people. Mm -hmm. um, now, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be you know, worth it um, in terms of time saving um, for the human beings to adopt that. Um, you know, so there may be three or four people that the machine has missed. But you know what? Is it worth spending 20 hours finding those two or three people, or will these 10 do? So there's a concept Effort in that. Effort reward is a balance, isn't it? Yeah, there's a concept in, in recruitment called optimal stopping. Um, and, and I think that that's something that's worth thinking about. Yep. You know, we don't, we don't look at the best candidate on the market because you know what, that will take us absolutely forever to go through 7 billion people. If we want to do yep. due diligence, that's what we truly do, but we don't because we finish and stop optimally at someone who's good enough. Um, and I think these machines will help us do optimal stopping a lot sooner. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So actually it was one of the things it's a topic. It kind of segues nicely into a topic I wanted to talk about, which is what do you see as, as trends for sourcing in, in 2019? So I you've you've given a bit of an insight there. I'm going to add something to it, which is I think that um, the future for sourcers and in 2019, I'm already seeing people readapting their skills into being data analysts and being um, uh, pipeline nurturers. So that's the two. That's the two areas that I think that sourcers um, and their skill set can can be can be really really well deployed for in in twenty nineteen. Yeah, I, lo I love the term um, pipeline nurturers. That's exactly right. You need to have individual people who kind of cultivate relationships. They need to be decoupled from having a headcount. Um, uh, you need to take the transactional pressure away from people that do relationship management. In my view, um, it's similar. You know, um, uh, it, it's kind of like the, you know, in, in for a lot of tech companies that do B two B, they have a, they have an evangelist, like a brand evangelist, who's typically someone from the community that literally spends time just talking back to the community. Yeah. Um, and their purpose is really to make sure the brand is is front of mind. Also, to do market intelligence, do kind of uh, customer service in advance of this person being a customer. Uh, and also to do all the customer support in advance of this person being a customer. Um, so all of this method, all that kind of model, I think, needs to work in in the recruiting space, particularly where, um, you know, I think this is your term and as you used a lot, Adam, it, where companies are recruiting for evergreen t roles. You know, it makes sense for you to actually have a few people that don't have headcount, just spend time talking to this community that you're always going to recruit for. Um, because um, what is the what is the added value of having just another recruiter filling seats um, when the opportunity cost of not actually engaging and, and uh, cultivating relationships with this uh, community is going to be is going to be huge. So yeah, I think you know sources uh, recruiters have always been um, very adaptable. I mean, we shouldn't forget that sourcing came from recruitment. Um, if you track back the history of where sourcing was back when we were doing recruitment, we were we were doing a bit of sourcing, right? Um, uh, we it was part of our job. It just wasn't a separate discipline. It wasn't a separate identity. Um, where it separated out uh, really tracked alongside with the explosion of the social web, uh, where suddenly 
everyone was producing data and everyone was producing information. And actually it became a really useful skill to be able to figure out how to pull that data back and identify people who are can potential candidates from all of this unstructured information. And that's where sourcing as a separate discipline emerged. Uh, and it was great because it allowed different types of people into the industry that perhaps wouldn't have become recruiters. Um, it allowed recruiters to get a lot more technically literate, which we needed to do. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it provided a bunch of stuff for us. But I think what sources will end up having to do is probably bending back into the recruitment world um, and not necessarily going separate. They need to go back into the, the traditional skills of recruitment, which is relationship building, which is engagement, which is you know being able to have dialogue with people. Because mm. the, the problem of, this, of recruitment is not necessarily discovery anymore, um, or at least that's a receding problem in recruitment. Yeah. Uh, the problem is actually going to be engagement, um, and those two things are related. You know, the more easy people are to find, the harder they are to engage. Because guess what? They're more findable. Therefore, mm -hmm. the noise level of of of, of their uh, uh, the, the receiving a lot more noise um, than they did before. So suddenly, we need to shift the balance. And I think sources recruiters will will certainly have the adaptability to do that. Yeah, one thing that I like about the source of skill set is they're curious. They use technology. They keep going. They leave all, all, you know, all rocks are unturned to find the information. They're really good at just getting some bits of information, putting it together to give them the answer that they need. And it's such an adaptable skill set that it can be used for so many different things. Um, and that's why I believe that data, data analysis and pipeline nurturing is something that uh, they can easily turn their hands to. The, the data visualization is, um, I know that's something that, that's a subject that you're interested in and I am also. It's the sort of thing that they're really good at. Um, I'm not saying they can be data visualizers necessarily, but um, interrogating that information and giving, putting together the picture, the answer that people need to make it easy. Yeah, no question. I mean, it, it's almost that's a, an issue, almost motivation. I think because there's no question that sourcing, technical sourcing, if you think, you know, of the manipulation of data and being able to extract data. Um, uh, they'll have the skill set to do the analysis and to, to, to take it to the next step, which is present it in, in, in a story. Uh, the question is, do they have the motivation to do that? And, you know, some people might not because sourcing itself is more investigative um, and it's like, oh, I've got the result. Um, but do they do all of them always want to tell people about the result? Probably not. It's, it's again, a different skill set. And what will happen is you'll get more people uh, entering into that world that previously, you know, would not have been sources because they're actually now because of these change, these the, the, these changing uh, trends, uh, yeah. they'll see it as a, as a good good move to to make. Yeah, let's move on to Maury's question. Um, she said Tim Sackett just wrote about employer brand marketing shifting to job marketing because people look for jobs, not companies. Do you think that will happen? I'm going to add a couple of things to that. Bill Berman's been saying the same thing for, for a number of years now. And his rationale for that, I haven't read Tim's piece, but Bill's rationale for that is that people of a certain age, and I know uh, a lot of people don't like talking about demographic cohorts, but millenniums and Gen Z want to um, understand what is that job going to do for me? What is that job going to give me? And not just what's that employer going to give me, it's what's that job going to give me. So they're not necessarily looking at what's the salary. They're not necessarily looking at what's the hours, what's the location, any of those kinds of things. They might be part of it, but overall it's how is this going to make me uh, enhance my CV? Um, any thoughts on that, Hung? Um, I, 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 I like the idea, um, but I have to say I'm not – uh, someone who has a clear opinion on it. Um, I think brand value is still going to be powerful. Um, there's no question if you're a business that has an A-list brand, that's going to be have a, have a strong impact in your ability to attract candidates. Um, uh, uh, that we, we still, like one of the, the main biases, um, uh, one of the criticisms actually of Tim and, and, and Bill's position, and again, I haven't thought deeply about this, but let me just uh, uh, walk and talk, so to speak. Um, is that one of the things that causes us to make decisions or helps us make decisions is familiarity bias. Um, uh, we, we typically um, uh, uh, say uh, are more welcoming uh, to new information if we're familiar to the brand or the person behind it. 
Uh, today, I didn't answer a phone because it was a no, no ID. Of course, I'm not going to answer it. Um, yep. uh, but if there's someone whose name I recognized, you know what? I would answer it. Now, one of the criticisms that potentially could be leveled at Tim's and, and Bill's view is that certain brands are recognizable already, uh, basically because they're big B2C brands, et cetera. And because yep. of that, um, people are they're going to be more able to, to um, get higher engagement because of the power of that brand. Now, jobs don't have brands necessarily right um uh, so for perhaps employer branding isn't going to be so decisive a shift into looking at branding jobs maybe people will focus on um understanding that they the different jobs themselves need to be need to have uh, uh, uh employer branding care and in other words you need to think about each job as having a different sort of uh, way of telling that story. And I've got massive sympathy with that view, particularly in tech, for instance, where you know I've worked with a bunch of companies that really struggled because they were B2C companies. Um, therefore, they had a strong B2C brand, but actually engineering, they needed a different brand because the engineers didn't think of them as a, as, as a, as a, as a strong source for, uh, uh, for, for their work. So then you had engineers, the department literally creating a separate sub brand within it. Um, but I, I'm not sure whether the relationship is, is as clear cut as saying the the employer brand is going to go away from a corporate point of view and we're going to focus trying to just pitch the job. I think that's probably maybe maybe stepping a little bit too far. But like I say, my 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 thinking around this is incomplete. Yeah. Okay. So um, you're right about you're right about the necessity to I think um, emphasize certain aspects of what the job is about in different job areas. And I can see from data that um, salespeople, for example, are influenced by entirely different types of content compared to software engineers. They want completely different things. If a salesperson's gone and looked at a job description, that is a zero indicator they're ready for a conversation. Whereas if the software engineer has gone and looked at a job description, they are right and they're ready for a conversation. That's the last thing they do before deciding whether or not they're going to they're going to you know apply for a job or they're ready for a conversation so um they do need treated in different ways and i think that from my perspective i don't think it replaces or shifts from employer brand but i think what it does is it adds an extra opportunity for organizations to better nurture their talent pipelines and I can see, I mean, I've, we use a lot of this. Our customers use a lot of what I call talent brand. So I'm adding a third concept in here, but it's related to the brand of jobs. The talent brand being the brand of the hiring managers, making them famous, making them people that individuals are going to want to work for, giving them a following. Um, and our customers are doing that with a lot of success. Um, and, and in fact, I know, I, I know Maury very well, and I know that uh, Maury would agree that that's a valuable thing to probably uh, try and do. So, the, you know, the brand of the hiring manager, I think, is something that is is worth amplifying. Yeah, no, no doubt. And, and perhaps you've described it a lot better than I have in this case. Um, and also, you know, we need to move, perhaps not have an oppositional view to say employer brand versus job brand versus hiring manager brand. Yeah. Um, because those, the, 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 all of those things will actually dovetail together uh, and, and support each other in, in the ideal case. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe the, the right way to talk about this is that we will uh, compl complicate uh, the uh, idea of employer brand to not only just think about it as a corporate message, but to think about the hiring manager, to think about the, the, the individual types of work that will be done and so forth. So, so yeah. Um, it feels like we've made some progress here, at least as far as my thinking is concerned. So thank you very much for that. So to, to just add to that quickly on employer brand, I've got a very specific view about employer brand, which employer branding people don't like very much. And that is yeah. that every single thing they do, because you can't create an employer brand. An employer brand is what people think of your organization. However, you can undertake employer branding initiatives, which will be intentioned to change the way that people think of you. Every single thing that they do needs to demonstrate ROI. It needs to be measured and it needs to link to the pipeline. And that's that's a view that I have. And the other thing, I, the other view I have on that is employer branding people 
need to seriously broaden their portfolio of influence because the only time that people actively go and uh, try to understand what your employer brand is is at the point where they are in the kind of what I call the consideration phase. They are they're, they're, they're doing a bit more than education, but most people are not in the market and they don't care about your employer brand. But what they will care about much more is the talent brand. It's the hiring manager. What has that individual got to say? How could how could that person help me and give me information that will assist my career? So, yeah, employer brand people don't like that view very much because it challenges them quite a lot. Um, okay, so a couple of other things. Um, in fact, a lot of other things. And so let's talk about um, RPOs. Um, so I know we're talking about lots of different big subjects here, but let's go. Yeah, it's fine. I want to. I want to talk about. I want to talk about RPOs. So Audra, so should we not spend a million dollars on a fancy career site? You should redeploy that million dollars on uh, content that's actually more interesting to the people that are not in the market today. So I entirely think that that one million dollars should be a hundred grand, and the rest and, of the yeah. Night and in Audra, you should not spend a million dollars on any website. Particularly URL, it doesn't need to be that. Nah. Um, right, RPOs. Um, Hung, is twenty nineteen a year of success or failure for RPOs? It's success, no doubt, and it's it's been a continual sort of track where we've seen the growth of RPO and diversification of RPO into different verticals. So I'm very pleased to see this development. Um, uh, I'm friends with a lot of. Uh, people who founded RPOs um, and, and have subsequently had great success. Um, it's great to see the model emerge away from the big bank scenario. Um, you know, back in the day, back in our day, if, you, if, if the audience isn't bored of us invoking the ancient history, um, but um, you know, the only RPO model was like, it would be a huge bank that didn't want to have all of these recruiters on staff. Um, yep. and, and, and that model will work there. But now you're seeing it in tech, you're seeing it in rapid growth businesses, you're seeing it in media. Um, it's a very vi viable third option, um, uh, uh, even a transitionally a transitional option for companies that aren't don't want to spend all of their money on third party agents, but also not ready uh, yet uh, to build an internal recruitment capacity for themselves. So um, I think it's a, it's a great model. Like it's here to stay. Some really talented uh, people are doing it. Some great companies there. So so yeah, big fan. Okay, so um, I think that RPO is going to generate further market share in 2019. I think that there's half a dozen RPO businesses I know who are more sophisticated than almost any internal talent acquisition team I know because they've got centers of excellence and they've got innovation teams and they've got tech teams. I think that they learn from the wide variety of customers that they have. And they're starting no to be much, much better at deploying successes from one customer into another. They're becoming less competitive as account teams and more collaborative. Um, and I think that's been a massive shift in the last even just two years. Um, I also believe that employers are starting to consider RPOs not just for their cost saving, but for the and, – and not just because of the risk – uh, the, the 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 risk reduction of hiring their own teams, but actually because of the innovation they bring. One of my favorites is Cielo Talent, and their kind of motto, if you like, is we become you. But I can tell you because a couple of people have said it publicly, uh, at senior people at that business, they're starting to wonder if that's the right tagline because their customers are coming to them not because they want them to become them, but because they want to, them to lead them when it comes to talent acquisition. So they deliberately don't want them to become them. So I, I think that this is a, I think it's an unstoppable force and, uh, and, and for the good of recruitment uh, in, in general. And there's a, most people I don't think would agree with that or understand what I'm saying. Yeah, well, I agree 100. percent You know, we can close the door on that discussion. Um, I think that um, uh, we're aligned. In, in that, uh, I think it's a, it's a deep professionalization of, of the industry. Um, uh, it it's basically makes the experience of recruitment better. 
um, for uh, almost everyone who interfaces with it. And this is not me saying uh, every RPO is amazing because of course that's not the case. Mm. Um, uh, but it is definitely the case that you can't really be persistently mediocre uh, and get away with it. Um, whereas as a recruitment agent, uh, you could probably do that because you're doing a lot of the spot business. You're doing, you know, uh, I wouldn't say hit and run type business. So I don't want to be unkind to third party agents, but you can potentially um, uh, uh, not be a great supplier and still commercially do very well um, because you're doing one deal here, you're doing one deal there or whatever it might be. So, um, but with uh, RPOs really, um, uh, they, they've been, they've been, it's great to see them emerge. Um, I'd like to see, I'd, I'd like to see the movement kind of continue to go into other verticals, uh, which, uh, which need to, need to, which currently don't have active suppliers, you know? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. One area of consistent, uh, one area of consistent criticism of RPOs and one area which I do believe they, they need to work on, um, is candidate experience. Um, I think that can, um, there's, there's limited examples that I've seen of where an RPO has enhanced candidate experience. Um, but you know, if they can, if they can enhance that, I think that in every area, that would be in every area, they are an asset to our industry. Um, I'm conscious of time. I want to focus on one more thing. There's a lot, there's a, there's a, there's still a lot of things that we can talk about, but there's, there is one more thing I want to focus on. And that is um, just another category of, of organization within, within recruitment, which is uh, recruitment agencies. So um, what do you believe 2019 has in store for the success or otherwise of recruitment agencies? Um, I think recruitment agencies uh, will always have a role to play as so long as human beings are being recruited by other human beings. Um, so I'm, I'm on record as being a defender of recruitment agents because I think they do get a lot of undue stick. Um, uh, the, the, I think that recruitment agencies that I see are su succeeding in the ones that have made the decision to be vertical specialists. So I think the old school relationship driven generalist, the kind of recruiter I was, I don't think I would be able to trade very well in today's uh, environment um, because you can't just do business by being a nice guy. Um, I think the sort of information that agencies have that even RPOs and, and uh, the, the AIs and all those types of things we talked about before uh, don't have is the mentality of the candidates they, because they, they should be speaking to um, a certain demographic. They should be in contact with uh, those candidates all the time. They'll be able to monitor, check and even nudge those candidates into activity or not. Um, and that, as soon as they have that information, they'll have it current, more current than anything else on the market. Um, and I think that data currency that they have is what's going to make uh, agencies still succeed. Um, you can still see, you can, and to do that better, you, you'll see agencies start becoming more community builders. We talked about ecosystem before. We see some great examples of companies doing that. The more than just putting bums on seats, they're getting involved in events. They're starting to, you know, do all sorts of support around uh, the community, not just transacting or placing people. So yeah, I think that you're going to get companies that are very, very good doing. Um, a certain types of role, um, and the, these are companies that will have a, a community first mentality. Yeah. Um, and you know, they'll do a lot of the talent nurturing and all that type of stuff that you talked about in traditional pipelining. Um, but they'll do it because they, they're collecting the intelligence, they're building the social capital, uh, they're building their customer base, and they're also building the ability to engage the candidate community when, when the jobs are actually there. So, those agents will survive definitely. Yeah. Okay. So I, I entirely agree with what you said. And I think that those agencies that are able to convert themselves into communities have got brilliant futures. You're right about the, the comment about being generalist. I think specialist is the added value for them. Um, specialist is the added value for them. The ability to, the ability to retain relationships with their candidates in between periods of recruiting them. It's something they've tra traditionally been really bad at. But if you take, I mean, a lot of our customers, so we've got probably 20% of my customers are recruitment agencies, and it's, re they're, they're, it's the really smart ones. It's the ones that want to be become the center of a community. And if you take a business like the Mullings Group, um, everybody, agency, RPO, in-house team, Everybody in HR and recruitment can has got a blueprint there 
of how to do it in 2019. Just copy what they're doing. That's my kind of... Well, well, I mean, it, it would be difficult copy because Joe, Joe is a is a very um is a very charismatic guy to be on camera and on stage and all the rest of it, um and he but he's also taken a big risk um by investing so heavily in his inbound marketing team, um but I think you could definitely learn a huge amount from what they're doing. So for yeah. people who don't know, Mullins Group are basically a U.S. based recruitment agency that's supplying to the medical tech Med center or something like yeah. that. Um, so, but I think his his vision is um is simply to say you know what we just need to be front of mind into this community um and that will translate into business um and i think that you could replicate that model for sure into whatever vertical you happen to be special specializing in mm -hmm. but for sure you need to be specializing in a vertical and you really need to uh, to double down on it you know you can't just um uh, pretend that you're this kind of company and then start doing some business that is off that because uh, it's that, that opportunity cost is, is what is going is what's going to kill you mm, yeah absolutely um we're coming towards the end of the hour um i think we should wrap here because we, there are about there are about 10 other really important subjects that we we should cover um i think hung let's you and i decide if we're gonna do a, a part two and cover the other issues um i don't want us to become like the anton deck of um it's too, crowd, it's, too, crowdcast. it's too late adam i think that's we just have to embrace the role <laughs> you're, you're you're aunt in that case well, uh, i don't even know who those two characters are in terms of their personalities but i think um there uh, isn't one of the actually yeah they're both nice guys but one of them's had some trouble recently is that is that the thing yeah, yeah i'm the one not in trouble i'd say um <laughs> But yeah, let's let's see what the crowd says. If they want us to continue and do another one of these, we can just roll roll on and do another one next week. Um, otherwise, um, otherwise, yeah, it's been great having a chat, and you know, we'll be we'll be ch talking again a couple of days later, I think, on on, on the the Brain Food Live on air, I believe. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that, and uh, yeah, let, let's let's. Uh, well, it looks like we're getting some call to do this again, so let's 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 do it again in a week or so, and let's get a couple of guests on as well. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks All for right. listening, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for taking part. Hung, see you soon. Cheers. <coughs> Excuse me.